Chapter Fifty One of Adam Bede by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Denham. Sunday morning. Lisbeth's touch of rheumatism could not be made to appear serious enough to detain Dinah another night from the Hall Farm, now she had made up her mind to leave her aunt so soon, and at evening the friends must part. For a long while, Dinah had said, for she had told Lisbeth of her resolve. "'Then it'll be for all my life, and I shall ne'er see thee again,' said Lisbeth. "'Long while? I ain't got no long while to live. And I shall be took bad and die, and thee canst ne'er come anigh me, and I shall die a-longing for thee.' That had been the keynote of her wailing talk all day, for Adam was not in the house, and so she put no restraint on her complaining. She had tried poor Dinah by returning again and again to the question why she must go away, and refusing to accept reasons which seemed to her nothing but whim and contrariness, and still more by regretting that she couldna have one of the lads, and be her daughter. "'Thee couldsna put up with Seth,' she said. "'He isna clever enough for thee, happen, but he'd have been very good to thee. He's as handy as can be at doing things for me when I'm bad, and he's as fond of the Bible and chaplain as thee ought to send. But happen thee'dst like a husband better as isna just the cut of this end. The running brook is na a thirst for the rain. Adam had a done for thee, I know he would, and he might come to like thee well enough if thee'd stop. But he's as stubborn as the iron bar, there's no bending him nowhere but own. But he'll be a fine husband for anybody, be they who they will, and so looked on and so clever as he is and he'd be rare and loving. It does me good only a look of the lad's eye when he means kind toward me." Dinah tried to escape from Lisbeth's closest looks and questions by finding little tasks of housework that kept her moving about, and as soon as Seth came home in the evening she put on her bonnet to go. It touched Dinah keenly to say the last good-bye and still more to look round on her way across the fields, and see the old woman still standing at the door, gazing after her till she must have been the faintest speck in the dim, aged eyes. The God of love and peace be with them, Dinah prayed as she looked back from the last stile. Make them glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted them, and the years wherein they have seen evil. It is thy will that I should part from them. Let me have no will but thine." Lisbeth turned into the house at last, and sat down in the workshop near Seth, who was busying himself there with fitting some bits of turned wood he had brought from the village into a small work-box, which he meant to give to Dinah before she went away. "'Thee'd see her again a Sunday afore she goes,' were her first words. "'If thee wast good for anything, thee'dst make her come in again a Sunday night with thee, and see me once more.' "'Nay, mother,' said Seth, "'Dinah would be sure to come again if she saw right to come. I should have no need to persuade her. She only thinks it'd be troubling thee for naught just to come in to say good-bye over again. She'd ne'er go away, I know, if Adam would be fond on her and marry her. But everything's so contrary," said Lisbeth, with a burst of vexation. Seth paused a moment and looked up, with a slight blush at his mother's face. "'What, has she said anything of that sort to thee, mother?' he said, in a lower tone said? Nay, she'll say nothing. It's only the men as have to wait till folks say things afore they find them out. 
"'Well, but what makes thee think so, mother? What's put it into thy head?' "'It's no matter what's put it into my head. My head's none so hollow as it must get in, and not to put it there.' "'I know she's fond on him, as I know the wind's coming in at the door, and that's enough. And he might be willing to marry her if he knowed she's fond on him.' "'But he ne'er think on if somebody does na put it into his head.' His mother's suggestion about Dinah's feeling towards Adam was not quite a new thought to Seth, but her last words alarmed him lest she should herself undertake to open Adam's eyes. He was not sure about Dinah's feeling, and he thought he was sure about Adam's. "'Nay, mother, nay!' he said earnestly, thee must na think o' speaking o' such things to Adam. Thee's no right to say what Dinah's feelings are if she hasna told thee, and it'd do nothing but mischief to say such things to Adam. He feels very grateful and affectionate toward Dinah, but he's no thoughts towards her that it'd incline him to make her his wife, and I don't believe Dinah would marry him either. "'I don't think she'll marry at all.' "'Eh,' hey, said Lisbeth impatiently, "'thee thinks so, cause she wouldn't have thee. "'She'll ne'er marry thee. "'Thee mightst as well like her to have a brother.' "'Seth was hurt. "'Mother,' he said in a remonstrating tone, "'don't think that of me. I should be as thankful to have her for a sister as thee wouldst have her for a daughter. I've no more thoughts about myself in that thing, and I shall take it hard if ever thee says it again. Well, well, then thee shouldn't cross me with saying things on her as I say they are. But, mother, said Seth, thee'dst be doing Dinah a wrong by telling Adam what thee thinks about her. It'd do nothing but mischief, for it'd make Adam uneasy if he doesn't feel the same to her, and I'm pretty sure he feels nothing of the sort. He don't tell me what thee'd sure on. Thee knows naught about it. What's he all is going to the poisers for if he didn't want to see her? He goes twice where he used to go once. Happen he knows na as he wants to see her. He knows na as I put salt in's broth, but he'd miss it pretty quick if it weren't a there. He'll ne'er think of marrying if it isn't a put in two's head. And if thee'dst any love for thee mother, thee'dst put him up to it and not let her go away out of my sight when I might ha her to make a bit of comfort for me afore I go to bed to my old man under the white thorn. "'Nay, mother,' said Seth, "'thee must na think me unkind, but I should be going against my conscience if I took upon me to say what Dinah's feelings are. And besides that, I think I should give offence to Adam by speaking to him at all about marrying, and I counsel thee not to do it. Thee mayst be quite deceived about Dinah. Nay, I'm pretty sure by words she said to me last Sabbath, as she's no mind to marry. Eh, thee tis contrary as the rest on em. If it were summat I didn't have wanted, it'd be done fast enough. Lisbeth rose from the bench at this, and went out of the workshop, leaving Seth in much anxiety, lest she should disturb Adam's mind about Dinah. He consoled himself after a time with reflecting that, since Adam's trouble, Lisbeth had been very timid about speaking to him on matters of feeling and that she would hardly dare to approach this tenderest of all subjects. Even if she did, he hoped Adam would not take much notice of what she said. Seth was right in believing that Lisbeth would be held in restraint by timidity, and during the next three days the intervals in which she had an opportunity of speaking to Adam were too rare and short 
to cause her any strong temptation. But in her long solitary hours she brooded over her regretful thoughts about Dinah, till they had grown very near that point of unmanageable strength when thoughts are apt to take wing out of their secret nest in a startling manner. And on Sunday morning, when Seth went away to chapel at Treddleston, the dangerous opportunity came. Sunday morning was the happiest time in all the week to Lisbeth, for as there was no service at Hazlip Church till the afternoon, Adam was always at home, doing nothing but reading, an occupation in which she could venture to interrupt him. Moreover, she had always a better dinner than usual to prepare for her sons, very frequently for Adam and herself alone, Seth being often away the entire day, and the smell of the roast meat before the clear fire in the clean kitchen, the clock ticking in a peaceful Sunday manner, her darling Adam seated near her in his best clothes, doing nothing very important, so that she could go and stroke her hand across his hair if she liked, and see him look up at her and smile, while Jip, rather jealous, poked his muzzle up between them. All these things made poor Lisbeth's earthly paradise. The book Adam most often read on a Sunday morning was his large pictured Bible, and this morning it lay open before him on the round white deal table in the kitchen, for he sat there in spite of the fire because he knew his mother liked to have him with her, and it was the only day in the week when he could indulge her in that way. You would have liked to see Adam reading his Bible. He never opened it on a weekday, and so he came to it as a holiday book, serving him for history, biography, and poetry. He held one hand thrust between his waistcoat buttons, and the other ready to turn the pages, and in the course of the morning you would have seen many changes in his face. Sometimes his lips moved in semi-articulation. It was when he came to a speech that he could fancy himself uttering, such as Samuel's dying speech to the people. Then his eyebrows would be raised, and the corners of his mouth would quiver a little with sad sympathy. Something, perhaps, old Isaac's meeting with his son touched him closely. At other times, over the New Testament, a very solemn look would come upon his face, and he would, every now and then, shake his head in serious assent, or just lift up his hand and let it fall again. And on some mornings, when he read in the Apocrypha, of which he was very fond, the son of Syrac's keen-edged words would bring a delighted smile, though he also enjoyed the freedom of occasionally differing from an apocryphal writer, for Adam knew the articles quite well, as became a good churchman. Lisbeth, in the pauses of attending to her dinner, always sat opposite to him, and watched him, till she could rest no longer without going up to him and giving him a caress to call his attention to her. This morning he was reading the Gospel according to St. Matthew, and Lisbeth had been standing close by him for some minutes, stroking his hair, which was smoother than usual this morning, and looking down at the large page with silent wonderment at the mystery of letters. She was encouraged to continue this caress, because when she first went up to him he had thrown himself back in his chair to look at her affectionately and say, "'Why, mother, thee looks rare and hearty this morning. Hey, Jip wants me to look at him. He can't abide to think I love thee the best.' Lisbeth said nothing, because she wanted to say so many things. And now there was a new leaf to be turned over and it was a picture, that of the angel seated on the great stone that has been rolled away from the sepulchre. This picture had one strong association in Lisbeth's memory, for she had been reminded of it when she first saw Dinah, and Adam had no sooner turned the page and lifted the book sideways that they might look at the angel than she said, "'That's her! That's Dinah!' 
Adam smiled, and looking more intently at the angel's face, said, "'It is a bit like her. But Dinah's prettier, I think.' "'Well, then, if thee thinks her so pretty, why aren't fond on her?' Adam looked up in surprise. "'Why, mother, dost think I don't set store by Dinah?' "'Nay,' said Elizabeth, frightened at her own courage, yet feeling she had broken the ice, and the waters must flow, whatever mischief they might do. "'What's the use of setting store by things as a thirty mile off? If thee wast fond enough on her, thee wouldst na let her go away.' "'But I've no right to hinder her if she thinks well,' said Adam, looking at his book as if he wanted to go on reading. He foresaw a series of complaints tending to nothing. Lisbeth sat down again in the chair opposite to him, as she said, "'But she wouldn't think well if thee wasn't so contrary.' Lisbeth dared not venture beyond a vague phrase yet. "'Contrary, mother?' Adam said, looking up again in some anxiety. "'What have I done? What does mean?' "'Why thee never look at nothing, nor think of nothing, but thy figuring and thy work,' said Lisbeth, half crying, "'and dost think thee canst go on so all thy life, as if thee was the man cut out a timber? And what would do when thy mother's gone? And nobody to take care on thee as thee gets a bit of victual comfortable in the morning?' "'What hast got in thee mind, mother?' said Adam, vexed at this whimpering. "'I canna see what thee driving at. Is there anything I could do for thee as I don't do?' "'Aye, and that there is. Thee might do as I should have somebody with me to comfort me a bit, and wait on me when I'm bad, and be good to me.' "'Well, mother, whose fault is it? There isna some tidy body of the house to help thee. It isna by my wish as thee has to stroke a work to do. We can afford it. I've told thee often enough. It'd be a deal better for us. E, what's the use of talking to tidy bodies when thee meanst one of the wenches out of the village, or somebody from Treddleston, as I ne'er set eyes on in my life? I'd sooner make a shift and get into my own coffin afore I die, nor ha them folks to put me in. Adam was silent, and tried to go on reading. That was the utmost severity he could show towards his mother on a Sunday morning. But Lisbeth had gone too far now to check herself, and after scarcely a minute's quietness she began again. Thee mightst know well enough who tis I'd like to have wi' me. It isna many folks I send for to come and see me, I reckon. And thee'st had the fetchin' on her times in o. They means Dinah, mother, I know, said Adam. But it's no use setting thy mind on what can't be. If Dinah would be willing to stay at Hazelup, it isn't likely she can come away from her aunt's house where they hold her like a daughter, and where she's more bound than she is to us. If it had been so that she could have married Seth, that had have been a great blessing to us. But we can't have things just as we like in this life. Thee must try and make up their mind to do without her. "'Nay, but I canna make up my mind when she's just cut out for thee.' and naught shall make me believe as God did the maker, and send her there a purpose for thee. What's it signify about her being a methody? It had happened where out on her we marrying. Adam threw himself back in his chair and looked at his mother. He understood now what she had been aiming at from the beginning of the conversation. It was as unreasonable impracticable a wish as she had ever urged, but he could not help being moved by so entirely new an idea. The chief point, however, 
was to chase away the notion from his mother's mind as quickly as possible. Mother, he said gravely, thee talking wild. Don't let me hear thee say such things again. It's no good talking of what can never be. Dinah's not for marrying. She's fixed her heart on a different sort of life. Very like, said Lisbeth impatiently, very like she's none for marrying when them as she'd be willing to marry would a ax her. I shouldn't have been for marrying your father if he'd ne'er axed me, and she's as fond of thee as e'er I were a thyus, poor feller. The blood rushed to Adam's face, and for a few moments he was not quite conscious where he was. His mother and the kitchen had vanished for him, and he saw nothing but Dinah's face turned up towards his. It seemed as if there were a resurrection of his dead joy. But he woke up very speedily from that dream. The waking was chill and sad, for it would have been very foolish in him to believe his mother's words. She could have no ground for them. He was prompted to express his disbelief very strongly, perhaps that he might call forth the proofs, if there were any to be offered. "'What dost say such things for, mother, when thee'st got no foundation for em? Thee knows nothing as gives thee a right to say that.' "'Then I know a note as gives me a right to say as the years turned, for all I feel it first thing when I get up in the morning. She isn't a fond of Seth, I reckon, is she? She doesn't want to marry him. But I can see as she doesn't behave toward thee as she does toward Seth. She makes no more of Seth's coming in iron, nor if he would, Jip. But she's all of a tremble when thee to sitting down by her at breakfast and a looking at her. Thee thinks thy mother knows not, but she were alive before thee wast born. But thee canst to be sure as the trembling means love, said Adam anxiously. Eh, what else should it mean? It isn't a hate, I reckon. And what should she do but love thee? Thee'd made to be loved, for where's there a straighter, cleverer man? And what's it signify her being a methody? It's only the marigold of the porridge. Adam had thrust his hands in his pockets and was looking down at the book on the table without seeing any of the letters. He was trembling like a gold seeker who sees the strong promise of gold but sees in the same moment a sickening vision of disappointment. He could not trust his mother's insight. She had seen what she wished to see. And yet, and yet, now the suggestion had been made to him, he remembered so many things, very slight things like the stirring of the water by an imperceptible breeze, which seemed to him some confirmation of his mother's words. Lisbeth noticed that he was moved. She went on, and thee'd find out as thee'd poorly off when she's gone. Thee'd fonder on her nor thee knowst. Thy eyes follow her about, well as gyps follow thee. Adam could sit still no longer. He rose, took down his hat, and went out into the fields. The sunshine was on them that early autumn sunshine which we should know was not summer's even if there were not the touches of yellow on the lime and chestnut the sunday sunshine too which has more than autumnal calmness for the working man the morning sunshine which still leaves the dew crystals on the fine gossamer webs in the shadow of the bushy hedgerows adam needed the calm influence he was amazed at the way in which this new thought of Dinah's love had taken possession of him, with an overmastering power that made all other feelings give way before the impetuous desire to know that the thought was true. 
Strange that till that moment the possibility of their ever being lovers had never crossed his mind, and yet now all his longing suddenly went out towards that possibility. He had no more doubt or hesitation as to his own wishes than the bird that flies towards the opening through which the daylight gleams and the breath of heaven enters. The autumnal Sunday sunshine soothed him, but not by preparing him with resignation to the disappointment if his mother, if he himself, proved to be mistaken about Dinah. It soothed him by gentle encouragement of his hopes. Her love was so like that calm sunshine that they seemed to make one presence to him, and he believed in them both alike. And Dinah was so bound up with the sad memories of his first passion that he was not forsaking them, but rather giving them a new sacredness by loving her. Nay, his love for her had grown out of that past. It was the noon of that morning. But Seth, would the lad be hurt? Hardly, for he had seemed quite contented of late, and there was no selfish jealousy in him. He had never been jealous of his mother's fondness for Adam. But had he seen anything of what their mother talked about? Adam longed to know this, for he thought he could trust Seth's observation better than his mother's. He must talk to Seth before he went to see Dinah, and with this intention in his mind he walked back to the cottage and said to his mother, "'Did Seth say anything to thee about when he was coming home? Will he be back to dinner?' "'Aye, lad, he'll be back for a wonder. He isna gone to Trelson. He's gone somewhere else a preaching and a praying. Hast any notion which way he's gone? said Adam. Nay, but he often goes to the common. Thee knows more as goings nor I do. Adam wanted to go and meet Seth, but he must content himself with walking about the near fields and getting sight of him as soon as possible. That would not be for more than an hour to come for Seth would scarcely be at home much before their dinner-time, which was twelve o'clock. But Adam could not sit down to his reading again, and he sauntered along by the brook, and stood leaning against the stiles with eager, intense eyes, which looked as if they saw something very vividly. But it was not the brook or the willows, not the fields or the sky. Again and again his vision was interrupted by wonder at the strength of his own feeling, at the strength and sweetness of this new love, almost like the wonder a man feels at the added power he finds in himself for an art which he had laid aside for a space. How is it that the poets have said so many fine things about our first love, so few about our later love? Are their first poems their best? Or are not those the best which come from their fuller thought, their larger experience, their deeper-rooted affections? The boy's flute-like voice has its own spring charm, but the man should yield a richer, deeper music. At last there was Seth, visible at the farthest stile, and Adam hastened to meet him. Seth was surprised and thought something unusual must have happened, but when Adam came up his face said plainly enough that it was nothing alarming. "'Where hast been?' said Adam, when they were side by side. "'I've been to the common,' said Seth. "'Dinah's been speaking the word to a little company of hearers at Brimstones, as they call him. "'Their folks as never go to church hardly. Them on the common.' but they'll go and hear Dinah a bit. She's been speaking with power this forenoon from the words, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And there was a little thing happened as was pretty to see. The women mostly bring their children with them, but today there was one stout curly-headed fellow about three or four year old that I never saw there before. 
he was as naughty as could be at the beginning while I was praying, and while we were singing, but when we all sat down and Dinah began to speak, the young un stood stock still all at once, and began to look at her with mouth open, and presently he ran away from his mother and went to Dinah and pulled at her like a little dog for her to take notice of him. So Dinah lifted him up and held the lad on her lap while she went on speaking, and he was as good as could be till he went to sleep, and the mother cried to see him. "'It's a pity she shouldn't have be been a mother herself,' said Adam, "'so fond as the children are of her. Dost think she's quite fixed against marrying Seth? Dost think nothing had turn her?' There was something peculiar in his brother's tone which made Seth steal a glance at his face before he answered. "'It'd be wrong of me to say nothing of Turner,' he answered. "'But if thee means it about myself, I've given up all thoughts as she can ever be my wife. She calls me her brother, and that's enough. But dost think she might ever get fond enough of anybody else to be willing to marry em? said Adam, rather shyly. "'Well,' said Seth, after some hesitation, "'it's crossed my mind sometimes a late, as she might. But Dinah had let no fondness for the creature draw her out of the path as she believed God had marked out for her. If she thought the leading was not from him, she's not one to be brought under the power of it. And she's always seemed clear about that, as her work was to minister to others, and make no home for herself in this world. "'But suppose,' said Adam earnestly, "'suppose there was a man as had let her do just the same, and not interfere with her. She might do a good deal of what she does now, just as well when she was married as when she was single. Other women of her sort have married, that's to say, not just like her, but women as preached and attended on the sick and needy. There's Mrs. Fletcher, as she talks of. A new light had broken in on Seth. He turned round, and laying his hand on Adam's shoulder, said, Why wouldst like her to marry thee, brother? Adam looked doubtfully at Seth's inquiring eyes, and said, "'Wouldst be hurt if she was to be fonder of me than of thee?' "'Nay,' said Seth warmly, "'how canst think it? Have I felt thy trouble so little that I shouldn't feel thy joy?' There was silence a few moments as they walked on, and then Seth said, "'I'd no notion as thee'dst ever think of her for a wife.' "'But is it of any use to think of her?' said Adam. What dost say? Mother's made me as I hardly know what I am with what she's been saying to me this forenoon. She says she's sure Dinah feels for me more than common, and would be willing to have me. But I'm afraid she speaks without book. I want to know if thee's seen anything. It's a nice point to speak about, said Seth, and I'm afraid of being wrong. Besides, we've no right to intermeddle with people's feelings when they wouldn't tell them themselves. Seth paused. But thee mightst ask her, he said presently. She took no offence at me for asking, and thee'st more right than I had, only thee'd not in the society. But Dinah doesn't hold with them as if for keeping the society so strict to themselves. She doesn't mind about making folks enter the society so as they are fit to enter the kingdom of God. Some of the brethren at Treddleson are displeased with her for that. "'Where will she be the rest of the day?' said Adam. "'She said she shouldn't leave the farm again to-day,' said Seth, "'because it's her last Sabbath there, and she's going to read out of the big Bible with the children.' Adam thought, but did not say, "'Then I'll go this afternoon. 
for if I go to church my thoughts'll be with her all the while. They must sing the anthem without me to-day. End of chapter 51 Recording by Tom Denham